Let's turn again to Romans 14 and verse 17. Remembering the words of Jesus, seek the kingdom of God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the other things will be added to you. So we are trying to understand what it means to seek God's kingdom first. It's not missionary work. It's not going to church. All those things may flow out from it. But it has to begin, as I said, from within. That's the main emphasis in the New Testament. That from within, God begins to work. We can say that in the Old Testament, God worked on the outside. <clears throat> because God could not dwell within man. And one of the wonderful things that happened after Jesus died was the third person of the Trinity could come within. Jesus told his disciples, it's good for you that I go away. And they couldn't understand that because, you know, whenever Jesus was with them, every problem could be solved. You, know, you never find a situation in the Gospels where Jesus was scratching his head, wondering what to do. Never, never, never. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I have believed that there is not a single problem I can ever face in my life that Christ cannot handle. <clears throat> if you can have that faith based on scripture, that the disciples could never bring a problem to Jesus which he, he could not handle. He could handle every one of them. And um, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why they couldn't understand, how can it be better for us if you go away? I mean, when you're not with us, we are scared of the waves and the storm. But when you're with us, you just calm it down. How can it be better when you go away? And the Lord said to them, if I go away, I can send the Holy Spirit. And he will be in you and will be with you forever. So let me turn you to that verse in John's Gospel, chapter 14. <clears throat> It's very important to read scripture carefully, slowly, and in, con in the context. So, listen to this. In the, uh, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There are two things I want to say on that. One, it was different in the Old Testament. I showed you that verse yesterday. In the Old Testament was, if you fear me, keep my commandments. That means, if you're afraid of me, if you don't want me to judge you, if you don't obey me, you know, Deuteronomy 28 lists all the things that can happen. So that's one of the big differences in the New Covenant, that it's another type of fear of God. You know, there are two types of fear of God, we can say. In the Old Testament, it was the fear that God will hurt me. In the New Testament, it is the fear that I might hurt God. Have you thought of that? One is the fear that God will hurt me. And the other is the fear that I might hurt God. So if you're living under the fear that God might hurt you, you're really going back to the old covenant. The fear of God that we need today is the fear that I might hurt God by the way I do things or the way I speak or something that he'll be grieved. That's the meaning of my hurting him. So that comes out of love. If you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. In Ephesians 4, it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You probably read that verse. Ephesians 4, you read it towards the end of that chapter. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, you cannot grieve an enemy. You can make an enemy angry. But it never says, don't make the Holy Spirit angry. When it says, don't grieve, you can only grieve somebody who loves you very much. So, when that word itself proves how much the Spirit of God loves us. So, the Lord says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then when you read that, you say, boy, those commandments are, that I shouldn't get angry, I shouldn't lust with my eyes and I must always speak the truth. I must love all my enemies. I must forgive everyone who hurts me. And when I pray, nobody should know about it. When I fast, nobody should know about it. When I give, 
anything. Nobody should know about it. And I must never judge anybody and I must never be anxious. I must not love money. And you listen to all those commandments in the Sermon on the Mount and you say, wow, how can I ever keep them? And the answer is it, that un unasked question. The answer is in the next verse. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. I'm the first helper. I've been with you all this time. Another helper and he'll be with you forever. So you see, the first time that Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit coming to his disciples as a helper is in the context of what? It's in the context of keeping his commandments. Never forget that. He said, you're going to find it difficult to keep my commandments. I know you love me. But because you're going to find it difficult to keep my commandments, I'm going to give you a helper to help you keep my commandments. That is the main purpose with which the Holy Spirit has come. So when you look at the commandments of Jesus in Scripture, they're all for our good. He never gives us a commandment which is bad for us. Sometimes we, you know, little children can't understand why their parents give them some rules. You tell a two-year-old child, don't play with that knife. Do you think that child understands it? If you take that knife out of that hand, the child will scream. Say, my daddy doesn't love me. He's taken this lovely shiny knife out of my hand. But you know it's for his good. There are many things God takes away from us which are for our good. And think of a child that's being taken to a doctor to get an injection. That's painful. But it's for his good. In the same way, there are some painful situations God may take us through which we don't understand. It's for our good. So every commandment of God is for our good. If you were seeking the very best for your life, and is there anybody here who doesn't want the very best for your life? I'll tell you, if you want the very best for your life, obey every commandment of Jesus Christ. That is the best life you can ever live. Where you take every command of God and you say, Lord, I'm going to obey it. It's one of the prayers I've prayed in my life for some time now. Lord, before I leave this earth, I want to obey every commandment that you have given for Christians. I don't want to leave this earth with any commandment that you've given for Christians that I have not obeyed. I mean, there are commandments you gave the Jewish people in the Old Testament. I don't know how to keep them. But if there's any commandment you gave for Christians, I want to obey all of them before I leave this earth. And the second thing I pray is, Lord, I want to claim all the promises that you've given to Christians, not the ones you've given to the Jews, all the promises that you've given to Christians before I leave this earth. If you get 10 checks in the mail, how many of them will you deposit in the bank? How long will you take to deposit them? One year? I don't know, in India, if you deposit after three or four months, it won't be cashed. It's, it's outdated. So, if you look at the com promises of God, like checks that you can cash the bank of heaven in the name of Jesus, I certainly want to cash every one of them. I don't want to get to heaven and discover that the, the promises God had for me that I never claimed on this earth because I was too lazy to find out what they were. A lot of people read the Bible to prepare sermons. I'll tell you honestly, I don't do that. I don't study the Bible to prepare sermons. When I started studying the Bible way back when I was 21 years old, I wasn't preaching those days, but I really wanted to know what scripture was. And I said, Lord, if there's one book, only one book in the world that you've written for man, I want to know that. And that's how I studied and I discovered so many things in scripture which other people never preached about. But I wanted to know what the promises were. I wanted to know what the commandments were. So I want to encourage you, if you feel the same burden, to pray that before you leave this earth or before Christ comes back, which may be pretty soon, I want to keep all the commandments and uh, claim all the promises. It's a very good prayer to pray. And the Holy Spirit has given us as a helper to keep those commandments and to claim the promises in prayer. And then he said, the spirit of truth, verse 17 whom the world cannot receive because it cannot see him and does not know him. But you know him. Now listen, see this phrase. Read it very carefully. 
right now the holy spirit is with you outside of you with you upon you but in the day of pentecost he will be inside you you see the difference what i've been telling you how the spirit of god seeks to the, when the veil is rent which happened on the day of on calvary when jesus died the veil was rent the way into man's spirit that tabernacle symbolized body soul and spirit the three parts of the tabernacle and the spirit part of it was veiled nobody could enter there man's heart could not be cleansed but when jesus died and opened up that veil then the holy spirit could come within till then he couldn't even come inside john the baptist great man that he was always upon upon every filled with the spirit in the old testament is upon they were used mightily but upon but in the new testament from within and that's why in the new testament character precedes service you know you can see from the example of samson particularly that even when he was living in adultery god still used him i mean the spirit of god was upon him he just had to keep that external vow of not cutting his hair and not drinking wine etc because the inner life didn't matter you take moses home life the only thing you read about moses home life is his fighting with his wife and uh, arguing about his two sons one of them was not circumcised that's the only thing you read about his home life but he was a great leader you read about samuel samuel is another great prophet in the old testament what do you read about his home life he had two sons and the man who was used by god to rebuke eli for the way he brought up his sons when samuel's own sons grew up you read in 1 samuel chapter 8 his own sons became wayward they were taking bribes and samuel appointed them as judges in israel these guys who were taking bribes Samuel's home life was not good. And the reason was he was always traveling about and he had no time for his family and that's how children go astray. So busy serving God, and the children were astray. But when you come to the New Testament, it says qualifications for an elder twice. It says in 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, he should have brought up his children properly. I work with over 70 churches and with over 100 elders and we follow that rule strictly that if a man's children the ones living at home i mean we're not thinking of children who've gone away from the home but if the children are living at home and the father is not able to control those children at home i say brother i think you should step down from eldership because the bible says if a man cannot take care of his own home with two or four children how can he take care of a church with 100 children people there So the family life the way a man lived with his wife the way he lives with his wife the way a man bring up his children is a very important condition for eldership in the New Testament church I know that a lot of churches don't follow it that's up to them but we seek to follow it in New Covenant Christianity and I've publicly said this if Moses and Samuel were here today I would not appoint them as elders in our church can you believe that that you wouldn't appoint Moses and Samuel as elders that's right because they don't qualify they haven't brought up their children well but people can say oh bye but look at the way they preach i say i don't care how they preach the family life their personal life is important in the new covenant the inside of the cup must be filled first it's this is so important that i i'm surprised that people haven't seen that in the new covenant the holy spirit's with you in that day he'll be in you from the innermost being the rivers of living water will flow and it's very very important in our churches that we emphasize this that we don't emphasize ministry apart from it flowing out from one's life very very important and so when we turn to Romans 14:17 which we've been looking at it says there that the kingdom of god is righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit now we thought a little bit about righteousness like the sun that gets brighter and brighter and brighter we should be progressing more and more we thought about peace another mark of new covenant righteousness is joy 
if you don't have joy in your life if your righteousness is a long faced miserable thing that's old covenant do you know that in the old covenant they were supposed to give their tithe but there was no commandment that you must give your tithe joyfully no no such commandment you've got to pay your tithe and the tithe by the way in the old covenant was not money because they didn't work in factories and offices they were farmers and shepherds their tithe was grain or cattle or sheep and it was the best equivalent that we can think of today is income tax tithe was like income tax god was the ruler of israel and he had appointed what we would call government servants you know that your income tax in this country pays the servants of the government that's how they get their salary that's why your income tax goes or where it's supposed to go anyway um uh, and in the old covenant god was in charge of the government and the government servants were the levites they did no other job their full time job was looking after the temple and they had to be paid in cattle and grain and so the lord told those his levites you're not supposed to own any property you're not supposed to do any earthly work no no farming no shepherding and so all the other 11 tribes were supposed to give 10% of their income that means their grain and their sheep to the levites that was income tax to take care of the levites who were looking after the temple that was a law of god now in the new covenant there's no such law because everybody is a servant of god i don't know whether you know that that you're supposed to be a servant of god too everybody is a son or a daughter of god and jesus said you're all my witnesses you can all receive the holy spirit unlike the old covenant where only some people receive the holy spirit upon them so today there is no such thing as income tax that's why i say that tithing is back to the old covenant again so all these people who frighten people by malachi 3:10 saying if you don't bring the tithe into the storehouse you're cursed are going back to the old covenant it's amazing how many churches are always going back to the old covenant and that's because they are the pastors are covetous and because money becomes their major thing in their thinking god leaves them alone you can't serve god and money jesus said you got to make a choice but in the new covenant the bible says you must give cheerfully turn with me to second corinthians and chapter 9 in second corinthians 9 it says he's talking about giving there are two chapters in second corinthians on giving and i want to tell you something it's got nothing to do with giving to preachers it's not got nothing to do with giving for god's work both chapters are dealing with give to the poor in jerusalem there are some poor saints please take care of them provide for them i'm not saying it's wrong to give to the lord's work i'm just saying these two chapters are related to giving but the principle applies to all giving jesus taught us when you give don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so it, that's the first lesson we learn in giving in the new covenant it must be secret the pr- proportion is not the important thing not 10% but secret your left hand must not know what your right hand is doing give secretly don't let other people know that's why in our church we never pass an offering background because people can see that you're giving we don't want people to see it we just keep a box and say give whenever try your best to give it when nobody's watching so second corinthians 9 says another law of giving is let everyone verse 7 second corinthians 9 7 let everyone give as he has purposed in his heart don't let anybody tell you how much you should give no pastor no elder can tell you how much you should give you have to purpose in your heart and it must not be grudgingly it must not be oh i have to give no it must not be out of compulsion don't let anybody force you to give even one cent for the poor or for the lord's work for god god loves a cheerful giver so it's the it's one who rejoices in giving the old covenant was not like that you know that it, it never said you must give your tithe cheerfully you bring your grain or your sheep to the levite 
and you come with a long face and say, I don't feel like giving this, but God sort of wants his 10 percent. Here it is. Take it. You could give like that and you've obeyed the commandment. But you can't give like that in the new covenant. No. You have to give cheerfully. Yeah, I heard a story once of a mother who was sending a child to Sunday school and said, well, here's one dollar for you to put in the offering when the Sunday school take their, pass their bag around. And here's 50 cents for you to buy some candy on the way back. And when she came back, the little girl, the mother asked, did you give one dollar in the offering Sunday school? She said, mommy, I wanted to give it. But just before we gave, the teacher said, God loves a cheerful giver. So I felt I could give the 50 cents far more cheerfully than I could give the $1. So I put 50 cents in and I bought candy with $1. Whatever the mother may have thought, that girl did what God wanted her to do. Do you know that? God loves a cheerful giver. And when you're hesitating, should I put that $20 in or the $100 in? And you say, I feel like putting $20. Don't put the $100, put the $20. God will not be happy if you give something reluctantly. It's very important to understand that God wants us to be happy. You know, in our church, at, near the door, we have this offering box and we have a little sign on top of it with five filters that you have to go through before you put money into the box. Number one, it's written there, are you born again? It's a great privilege to give money for God's work, but he will not take it from people who have not given their hearts first. He does not want money from those who are not his children. So if you're not born again, you, f you fail in the first filter, put your money back into your wallet and go home. Then there's a second filter which says, do you owe anybody any money? Go and give that person that money. Don't put it here. If you owe money to Caesar and to God, to whom should you give first? You know what Jesus said? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. In other words, if I owe somebody, say, Mr. X, I owe him some money, and I come and put the money, some money into the offering box, Actually, I'm giving that guy's money, not mine. Because I should be actually paying back my debt. And instead of paying back my debt to Mr. X, I'm taking that money which should have gone to him to clear my debt. And I'm giving it to God. And God says, I don't want it. I don't want his money. If you want to give, give your money. And if you owe him money, give it back to him. It's a very important principle. Now, if you have a house loan, that's not a debt. If you have a car loan, that's not a debt because you've got some asset equivalent of that debt. So if you take a balance, there's a house there and some money there, that's not a debt. There's a car there if it's insured for the same amount and there's a loan, that's not a debt. But if you've taken a loan for something else, just pay it back. It's very important. We, that's the second condition we put there. And um, so the guy wants to put the money in and he says, oh, I've got a debt. I say, put it back in your wallet. Don't put it there. And then number three, the thing that Jesus said, um, has somebody got a grudge against you because you got angry with him and you got upset with him and you hurt him? Jesus said, don't put your offering there. Go and settle it with that person, that matter. Then come and give your offering. That's in Matthew chapter 5, 23, 24. So we say, if, if you got something to settle with somebody, somebody you hurt, not somebody who's hurt with you, I mean, hundreds of people can be were hurt with Jesus. We don't have to settle anything with, because most people, a lot of people are hurt with me because of what I preach. Now, that's not what I mean. But if you have hurt somebody, you see the context there is you got angry with somebody and the person's upset with you. <clears throat> settle that before you put your money in the box. So again, another filter. And then number four, 1 Timothy 5.8 says, if you can't take care of your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever. That's quite a strong word. A man who doesn't take care of his children's needs is worse than an unbeliever. So I say, do your children have needs? Are you so poor that your children, they need food, clothing, edu uh, housing, education? Four things usually. Food, clothing, housing, and education. If you, you're not able to meet these four needs for your children, 
don't put your money here go and take care of your children and people sometimes question me on that how can you say that brother zack i mean god don't you think god comes before my children yes it's true but think of it like this supposing a father is a multi billionaire not millionaire but billionaire and one of his children is one of his own sons is very poor but because out of his love for his father he wants to give some money as a token gift to his father who's a billionaire and his father realizes my son is depriving his children of some food at home or depriving his children of a new set of clothes in order to give me that money do you think that billionaire father would accept it i wouldn't if i were a billionaire and my son wanted to make his children sacrifice something deny something to give to me i would say son listen i'm a billionaire i don't need you to sacrifice and deny make your children deny themselves an ice cream or something to give me that money i don't need it do you believe that your heavenly father is a billionaire i believe that my father is the richest person in the whole universe and he's not waiting for poor people to makes people sacrifice and deny their children something it's a completely different philosophy from what you normally hear from preachers i'll tell you that but in the new covenant we preach some radical things like that and so i say take care of your children provide for them and god is a billionaire who can take a, he, he's not dependent on your money and number 5 i say in the fifth condition there is are you giving to god in order to get some reward from him are you hoping that if you give like you hear somebody testify i gave and god gave me a new car rubbish god is not in the, in that business of and don't give in order to expect something in back give cheerfully expecting nothing and i say if you pass all these five filters then you can put the money in the box i remember somebody telling me after that brother zack with all those conditions does anybody put anything into that box <laughs> <laughs> i said we have run our churches over 70 75 churches for 40 years the the same principles we never take an offering in any of our churches we just have those boxes and we've run at least 200 conferences in the last 40 years everything in that conference is free accommodation food but when i say accommodation in india you know how we accommodate people we just clear the hall and roll mats on the floor and everybody sleeps there the sisters in another room and the brothers in another room so that that's we can't afford anything more than that i mean if you want to stay in a hotel go ahead and book a hotel but uh, we provide free accommodation simple type of accommodation that jesus and his disciples had when they wandered around the country <laughs> and uh, very simple food rice and a very simple vegetable curry that's it free breakfast lunch and dinner now three day conferences every year and we have never till today had a lack we have never made, had to mortgage a building to a bank till today we have built a number of meeting halls not one of them we had to we have never sent a report of our work to any country in the world many of you receive a word for the week which goes to thousands of people around the world and it's been going for nearly 20 years and if you've been receiving it you'd have noticed one thing there's not a single word of a report of our work none of you know how many churches we have from that paper none of you know what ministry we're doing because that's not what we write there we write the word of god there's no report because so many reports that come from india and these african and asian countries is a disguised way of asking for money orphanages and bible school are some of the biggest rackets that there are in these countries and i know because i live there so we decided to be different new covenant means we got to be different from all these old covenant way of we want people to be happy joy in the holy spirit and if you are not joyful in giving money don't give god does god wants you to be happy god loves a cheerful giver who says hallelujah i want to give something for god that's the way to give and if you can't give like that don't give so this is very important in this matter of giving because this is one of the i mention it because this is one of the main things i mean do you know the number of people who have written to me brother zack our church is all about giving the pastor gets up and he's got his sermon on giving and giving and putting pressure on people and they get fed up of it i say yes then they're not obeying god's word that's in the old testament that was okay so in the new covenant this is a very important area so joy is a very important aspect of new covenant righteousness 
and the bible says we must rejoice in the lord not in our circumstances in the lord always so many times when i'm under pressure i ask myself this question you know when so many things are going wrong earthly wise going wrong around me i say is god my father still on the throne he certainly is does he still love me as he says in john 17:23 that he loved me as he loved jesus he certainly does are all my sins forgiven yes has he said i will not remember your sins anymore yes was is satan still defeated on the cross 2000 years ago yes is christ coming back in glory soon yes well the most important things are okay in place so what does it matter if one or two trivial little things are wrong so i can rejoice not in my circumstances but in the most important things are okay i rejoice in the lord and we must train our mind to rejoice in the lord we have to say i exercise my will and i say i refuse to get discouraged i will only praise the lord not for these circumstances but because he's on the throne because he's in control and because i believe in romans 8:28 that even these adverse circumstances god will use to make me more like christ so in that sense we can even give thanks for our circumstances it says give thanks for all things this is possible in the new covenant do you know that there was no romans 8:28 in the old testament you know given as a promise there were a few godly men who experienced it i'll show you the romans 828 of the old testament if you haven't seen it turn with me to genesis in chapter 50 in genesis chapter 50 you see what i call the romans 828 of the old testament it's a story of joseph and you know joseph faced a lot of things which we would say was evil first of all his brothers tried to kill him but just when they were going to kill him one brother said don't kill him and at that very moment the ishmaelite traders came and they were going to egypt and they were joseph was sold to egypt that looked like an evil thing but that was exactly god's plan and when he goes to egypt he's in the house of potiphar and potiphar's wife accuses him falsely again looks like a very evil thing and sends him to prison but it's in prison that he meets pharaoh's cupbearer and that's how he gets an introduction to pharaoh if potiphar's wife had not accused him falsely he would never have gone to prison never have met pharaoh's cupbearer never have met pharaoh and another thing i don't have time to show you all these verses you read it in genesis 39 40:41 he interprets a dream to pharaoh's cupbearer in his prison and uh, and that's because it's very interesting how joseph himself facing all this injustice and he says he looks at two discouraged people this, this is a guy who got enough problems of his own but he's still wanting to encourage someone else who's discouraged. It's a wonderful thing when a person has a lot of problems on his own and he still wants to go around encouraging others. That's what Joseph did. It's a great example for all of us. You have problems of your own, look for somebody who is discouraged and go and encourage him and you'll be blessed yourself. That's what he did. With all his problems, he was not concentrating on that. He looked at these two discouraged people in the prison and said, "What's wrong with you?" And they said about this dream and he interpreted this dream and the dream was fulfilled. And Pharaoh's cupbearer was restored to his position a few days later. and joseph told pharaoh scupbearer please tell pharaoh that i have been unjustly imprisoned here and you know what it says pharaoh scupbearer forgot about him for 2 years joseph was only 28 years old then think of this 2 years later when pharaoh has this dream which nobody can interpret Pharaoh's cupbearer says, "Oh, I says I remember my fault now. There was a young guy there in prison who could interpret dreams." Pharaoh says, "Call him here." And Pharaoh comes and Joseph comes and he becomes the second ruler in Egypt. You know that story. You read it in all in Genesis 38 39, sorry. Uh 38 onwards all the way, 37 onwards, sorry, all the way down to the end of the book. And have you ever thought supposing Pharaoh's cupbearer had not forgotten and as soon as he went to pharaoh said hey my lord there's a young fellow there who's been unjustly imprisoned 
who interpret my dream to me. And Pharaoh said, okay, release him. Send him back to Canaan. <laughs> Would that have fulfilled God's plan? No. And so you see that even when somebody forgets to keep a promise he made for you, made to you, what should you do? Have you had an experience of somebody promising something and not keeping it? Joseph's story is it'll work for your good. Just give thanks. Two years later was the time when Joseph was ready to be released. So all these things work for Joseph's good. And now he says to his brothers when they come to see him in Genesis 50 and verse 20. As for you, my brothers, you meant it for evil against me but God meant it for good not only for me but for all these people in Egypt who have been preserved in this time of famine because I came and stored up enough grain for them and for people around Egypt to bring about this present result this is the Romans 8 28 of the Old Testament and it was spoken by a man who experienced it so what I want to say is much more true in the new covenant there it was just an earthly blessing. But here it's becoming like Christ. And it is when I believe this, this new covenant promise that the Holy Spirit has come to help me, live inside me, solve my problems, and uh, make everything work for my good, never demands anything of me. Doesn't say I must give my money or my time. No, everything I give must be cheerful. If I give up my time to the Lord, it must be cheerful. There's no compulsion that you have to give so many hours to God, so, many, so much of your money to God, so much of it. Nothing. God loves a cheerful giver applies to all giving. Giving of obedience. If you're not happy to obey God's commands, I say forget it. Don't obey it. Whatever you do must be joyfully. And if you do it like that, years later, you will be able to say, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows, like that song says. And I can say that today. I've been a Christian for 57 years, and 50 years of those has been full-time Christian work where I support myself. And I can really say, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And it's a tremendous joy for me to serve the Lord. And I keep praying that God will give me help to serve him endlessly till he comes again. I'm not looking for the grave like we sing in that song, in that song, the sky, not the grave, is our goal. Our goal is never to be the grave. It's always the sky, Christ coming back. So, your life will be different if joy is an important part of your righteousness. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We read in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. It's really true. There's a strength that comes in our life through joy. A merry heart does good like a medicine, it says in the book of Proverbs. It's good medicine. So joy is a very important part of our Christian life. It's not an optional extra. In fact, if it is not there in my life, I have to say I'm not really living the new covenant life. For myself, I have said, Lord, there must never be a time where I cannot rejoice in everything that happens. I don't enjoy everything, but I can rejoice that God is fulfilling his purposes. I mean, Paul, do you know this wonderful epistle of joy is Philippians number of times we call it the epistle of joy but do you know where Paul wrote it he wrote it in a Roman prison and the Roman prisons were not like the prisons those days there were cockroaches and mosquitoes and rats running all over the place and he didn't even have a blanket to cover himself it's in that type of situation he says rejoice in the Lord always he found joy even in those circumstances because he was there for serving the Lord and he was happy if this is the way God wants me to face these days I say thank you Lord he worshiped God because God was more important to him than anything on this earth you know when we say that we are free from the old covenant we mustn't forget that the Old Testament is not the same as the old covenant the old covenant is that agreement that God made with Israel on Mount Sinai. The Old Testament is a history of the Israeli people. In fact, man has given those 37, 39 books the title Old Testament. Nowhere in the Bible does it say these 39 books are Old Testament. 
is never found in the Bible. It's just put there by man. There are 39 books of the Bible, which the history of Israel, and then 27 books after Jesus came. So the Old Testament has not been abolished. Far from it. In fact, I read the Old Testament primarily to understand the heart of God. Because God is the same. He hasn't changed in the Old Testament or the New Testament. One of the last verses in the book of Malachi is, I am the Lord, I do not change. So as you enter the pages of the New Testament, you're, that's the last word he says in the Old Testament, I'm not going to change. He's never changed. So I read the Old Testament to understand the heart of God. And I'll tell you what I've discovered. As I've read through the Old Testament, I've discovered that the thing that God hates the most, which he condemns Israel for the most, is idolatry. You read that. Many times the prophets could come and condemn Israel. You guys, you worship Baal, you worship Ashtoreth, you worship the Queen of Heaven. You idol worshippers, God is going to punish you. Idol worship, idol worship, idol worship is the number one sin that God condemned in Israel. He called it spiritual adultery. That means you're engaged to this man and you fool around with another man. Jehovah is your bridegroom, but you are going after Baal and Ashtoreth. You know, just like today, Christ is our bridegroom, and if something or someone takes the place that Jesus should have in my heart, that is idolatry. That is spiritual adultery. That's what makes me part of a system called Babylon the harlot, which you read of in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Very often it's money, where money has taken the place that Christ should have in my heart. And how do I know that? I mean, if you really love your bridegroom, you'll think more often of him than of another man. <clears throat> if you're engaged to somebody whom you really love, and most of the time you're thinking of some other man, I'd say you're, a, in your mind, you're an adulteress. Definitely. A person who's really loving her fiancé, whom she's looking forward to marry, she'll be thinking more often about him than any other man. <clears throat> and I say that is the test. Everything else other than that is idolatry. So how does this apply to me? <clears throat> if there's anything else I find my joy in other than Jesus, if Jesus is the one whom I delight in and there's nothing else that can give me more joy and fellowship with Jesus Christ. For myself, I've said then I'm an idolater. And I believe there are many idolaters in Christendom. They love Jesus. They want him to take, they want him to take them to heaven. But their mind is set on other things. There are other things that are more valuable to them than Christ. They want Christ because he's the one who can take them to heaven. But so often their mind is going to other things which are more important. I'm not talking about our necessary work by which we have to earn our living. No, don't misunderstand me. It's a question of affection. Where is your mind set? Where, what, in what do you find your joy? I remember once, many years ago, when I was a young Christian, still seeking to find my way through these things which nobody ever taught me and I had to find in the Bible myself. I never heard sermons on these type of things that you're hearing now. And... I said, Lord, I, how, what does it mean to find my joy in you? I remember once I was <clears throat> traveling in a bus in India and somebody pinched my wallet and took it out of my pocket. Uh, but he did such a neat job that I never felt it. And I felt he really deserved to get it because he did such a neat job. <laughs> I never felt a thing. When I got out of the bus, I found, hey, my wallet's gone. And okay, I said, perhaps the Lord's allowed this because... I must pray for him. Maybe this is a pickpocket who nobody's ever prayed for him in his life. At least well, let one person pray for him. So I prayed for him that uh, he would repent and find salvation. It happened to me a second time when I was traveling in a train. And such a crowded train. You know, the buses and trains in India are very crowded. It's very easy for you feel pressures here and there and you think it's some person pressing against your body. No, it's somebody picking your pocket. <laughs> and I came out of the train and I found wallet is missing again. Okay, there's another person to pray for. But I said, Lord, thank you that my joy was not inside my wallet. 
My joy was in my heart. My money was in my wallet. Make sure your joy is not inside your wallet. Make sure your joy is not inside your bank account. Keep your joy in your heart. If you lose money and your joy goes, you can be pretty sure your joy was in your bank account or in that real estate or in those shares or whatever else or in your business or something else. Keep your joy separate from all these earthly things. Righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, they were permitted to rejoice in, oh, your barns overflowed, wonderful. Your sheep multiply, wonderful. That's not permitted in the New Testament. Joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the true righteousness which we're supposed to seek. The kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What about joy in our children? It's right to rejoice in our children. But sometimes, but Jesus said, if anyone loves his father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. In fact, the first condition of discipleship in Luke 14 and verse 26 was that a man comes to me, he must hate his father, mother, brother, sister, wife, and children. Otherwise, you can't be a disciple. The meaning was that in Comparison, Jesus says, with your love for me, your love for your closest family members must be like almost like zero. Not that you shouldn't love them, but your love for me was supreme. And the way I've understood that is, if our love for our family members is like the light of the stars, our love for Jesus must be the light like the light of the sun. And you know how it is. When the sun comes up, the stars are still there, but you can't see them. You know there are stars in the sky right now, but you can't see any of them. Because the light of the sun is so bright. So it's not that you don't love your father or mother or wife or children or brothers and sisters. But in comparison to your love for Jesus, that's zero. It disappears. The contrast is so great. It's immense. The difference between the light of the sun and the light of the stars. And I see that that's how my love for Jesus must be compared to my love for my family members. We must love our wives, love our husbands, love our children. But very often, when our love for these become very subtly more than our love for Christ, it becomes idolatry. And that's how the joy goes out of our life. Because something's, something goes wrong here and I lose my joy. You know, that's why God told Abraham to offer up Isaac. It's not because of any other reason. Here was a man who never had children till the age of 100 and all of a sudden he got a child. And after a while, you know, you get a son when you're 100 years old, never had any children through your wife till then. After a while, he found that Isaac was becoming an idol in his, Abraham's life. And that's what God was against. Abraham, Isaac has become an idol in your life. Kill him! And I'm not asking you to... Uh, Act in a hurry. Take three days to think about it. So walk three days to Mount Moriah and think about it, whether it's worth serving a God like me who asks you to kill your son. And he walks three days. And you read that in Genesis 22. I don't have time to show you the verse, but read it sometime. He tells his servants, you stay here. I and the lad will go up to worship God. It's the first time in the Bible the word worship comes. Do you know what it means? I'm not going to have an idol in my life, not even my son. And he offered up his son and God said, don't kill him. I was just testing you. And see how God speaks to him after that. It's a wonderful chapter. The Lord says, after you have done this, Abraham, there's no limit to how much I'll bless you. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, God will say the same thing to you. If you destroy every idol in your life, and say, Lord Jesus, you're going to be more precious to me than father, mother, wife, children. They're all yours. I'll be a worshiper. To be a worshiper in the new covenant means you have no idol in your life. Not your business, not your money, not your loved ones, not your family. Here's another person who worshipped. In the book of Job, you read the story there that in one day he lost his business and his children. All in, a, in the space of one day. And one after the other, the servants came and said, all your business is destroyed, your animals are all killed. And then the next person comes along and says, your sons and daughters have also been killed. 
And we read, as soon as Job heard this, Job chapter 1, verse 20, he tore his robe and he fell down and worshipped. The first two people in the Bible who worshipped are Abraham and Job. Job, by the way, was written before Genesis. Job lived 500 years before Moses who wrote Genesis. So the first two people who wrote, who worshipped were Job and Abraham. And what does it say about their worship? It wasn't singing songs and what we call praise and worship is a complete misnomer. What we sing in the morning is not worship, Sunday morning. It's praise and thanksgiving. You, you examine the words of the songs. You know, it could be prayer, asking God for something. It could be thanksgiving, thanking God for what he's done. Or it could be praise, praising God for who he is. Asking him for something, thanking him for what he's done, or praising him for who he is. It's not worship. Or if you read the words, it's all prayer, thanksgiving, or praise. What is worship? Worship is getting rid of every idol in your life. And it can be silent. It can be, Job wasn't singing songs. Abraham wasn't singing songs up there on the mountain when he worshipped. It was silent. He was saying, God, nobody's going to be as important to me as you in my life. And I want to tell you this. It's the people who have gone through that and said, Lord, I remove every idol from my life. Not my business, not my job. Nothing is going to be idle. I'm going to find my joy in you, in your presence. Such worshippers have entered into the new covenant joy. And what did Job see that day in front of him? Ten coffins. Ten coffins. And the only reason why Satan didn't kill his wife, because Satan said, I, she's more useful to me alive than that I can keep on using her to nag him and nag him and nag him. Otherwise, he could have killed his wife too. And I remember when I read this and I discovered what worship was years ago when my children were all small, I had my wife and four little children. In my mind, I saw five coffins. Years ago, my wife, four children, all dead. And I said, Lord, I'll do what Job did. I'll worship you. These, I love them all, they are my very life, but they will never mean more to me than you. And I've sought to live in that all these days. Because I want to be a worshiper, and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said in Matthew 4.10, you must first worship, then you must serve God. So there's an order, and I learned there that I cannot serve God if I don't worship. Now God has not allowed my wife or my children to depart because he's got a purpose for them. But in my mind, I was just trying to prove was God more important than my wife or children. I remember the first time I owned a house. I never in my life thought I'd ever own a house. But we got a cheap house in Bangalore where we moved and, uh, and I said, Lord, I'm scary. I thought I'd live in a rented house all my life. And lo and behold, here I'm owning a house. I'm scared. I don't want this house to become an idol to me. Take it away, Lord. Burn it up. I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me. I want you to be, uh, and I'll tell you many, many times when I turned the corner coming to my house, I expected to see my house in flames. And my wife and children standing outside. <laughs> but it didn't happen. But I had given it up to God. As far as I'm concerned, it was gone. Then the other thing was when I got a new scooter. We ride scooters in India. I've ridden a scooter for 42 years in India. That's a mode of transportation, a two-wheel scooter. But when you get a new scooter, it's very interesting. You make sure that everything is clean. There's no scratch on it, etc., etc. And you almost worship it. And, <laughs> and I got this new scooter. And, of course, I wouldn't lend it to anybody. And it was all my precious treasure. And... And suddenly it produced some rattling noise inside. And I took it to a mechanic and the guy examined it and said, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't know why this rattling sound is there. Believe it or not, this is absolutely true. And I said, Lord, what's wrong with this? He says, Lord, the Lord said, you haven't offered it up to me. <laughs> You're worshipping this thing. I said, okay, Lord, it's yours. I don't care if it's destroyed or stolen or anything. It's never going to be mine. 
anymore. You know the rattling stopped? <laughs> and now you wouldn't believe these things. But it's really true. <laughs> I'm speaking the truth. It's amazing how God held me to this business of worship that nothing I ever got, property or children or anything, was going to be more precious than Jesus Christ. Now I want to say to you, my dear brothers and sisters, if you worship God like that, there is no limit to how much he will use you. Absolutely no limit. Just like he told Abraham, since you've done this, Abraham, there is no limit to how much I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing to every family that you meet. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And Galatians 3.14 says, that blessing is for us through the Holy Spirit. The blessing of Abraham. I said, Lord, I want to be like Abraham. And I want that blessing for me. That is how we live in the joy of the Lord all the time. Otherwise, one of these things get lost. We lose our joy. Some money. Maybe a child dies. Or this thing or that thing. And my joy is there. Rejoice in the Lord always. New covenant joy is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you think if you give that up to God, he's going to take it away? Did he take away Isaac? The ten children Job lost, he got ten more. God, God will always honor those who honor him. Many of us are missing something because we cling on to something. As if we can preserve it. You can't. Open your palm and give it up to him. And you'll have a joy that never, never sees. And I can say honestly today, I have begun to understand what it is. I who was such a slave to discouragement. It's gone from my life 100%. People don't believe me when I say I never get discouraged. I'm tempted, but I found my joy in the Lord. There's absolutely nothing on earth that is any substitute for joy in the Lord. I want to ask all of you sitting here, is that the Christianity you have? Or is it some third-rate type of Christianity where God is in a corner and you've got all the other things you're interested in and you say, oh Lord, build your church here. He's never going to build your church where you are. He won't build a church where you are in a hundred years because you're not a worshiper. You're worshiping something else. And you want to have the honor of being a one who builds a church. He'll never do it. There are people who come to our Bangalore conference and say, Oh, Brother Zach, this is wonderful. How this church, please come in uh, where we are and build a church where we are. I say, I can't build the church. Jesus said he'll build the church. And if he sees that you're a worshiper, he will use you the weakest. Even if you don't know the scriptures, he will use you to build his church where you are. But if you're not a worshiper, forget it. You'll just follow the pattern we have in CFC preach the same doctrine, sing the song, same songs, and it'll be as dead as any Roman Catholic church or any other church. It won't be the church of Jesus Christ. Sorry. God wants worshipers. Thou shalt worship and then thou shalt serve is the order in Rome, um, Matthew 4.10. That is how we can have righteousness with joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help that these truths will be deeply imprinted on our hearts. Your name will be glorified through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.